everyone. I'm so glad you're back to Growth Factor. You're looking at, I'm going to point, I think, in this direction, that direction. I don't know. Zoom always messes me up. But this is Dr. Thomas Seafried. He's amazing. You can find him all over the internet, all over YouTube, and many other apps. And he's basically here to tell us about cancer. There's so many myths, and a lot of us worry about it because we have friends or family that we lost to cancer. But the reason I do my show, I want to let you know why I invited the doctor professor here is that I used to have anxiety really bad. I had doom feelings. It was probably depression. And if I can just take some of that off your plate, I'm looking for answers just like you are. So that's why I have the professor here. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him, but then uh, more in the interview, I'm gonna tell you more because he has such a huge resume. But I'm gonna tell you first, he's a professor of biology at Boston College. He has his PhD in genetics and biochemistry from the University of Illinois Urbana, Urbana in 1976. He did his undergrad work in, at the University of England, and he recently received a very distinguished award. It's called the Alumni Achievement Award. That's so incredible. He helps so many people. I'm so glad you're here to listen to him. He has his master's degree in genetics from Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois, and he served in the US Army 1st Cavalry. He got a lot of medals and commendations. So I just want to read that to you because there's so much more to talk about. Can we start please with the cancer myth, Professor Dr. Seafried? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Amalia. It's nice to be here on your uh, on your program. Um, cancer myths. Uh, the biggest myth is cancer is is a, a genetic disease. Uh, that's the singular biggest myth. It's not a genetic disease. It's a mitochondrial metabolic disease, which means basically that cancer originates from damage to an organelle in our cells called the mitochondria. They often call it the power plant of the cell because it makes most of the energy for all the cells in our body. So when that little organelle gets damaged or dysfunctional, it starts the, pro it starts the path to dysregulated cell growth, which is, the or which is the definition of cancer. So the definition of cancer is cell division out of control disorganized cell growth. And that starts with damage to the mitochondria in the cell, leading then to downstream genetic mutations. So the myth is that cancer is caused by mutations. The truth is that the mutations are the result of the damage to the mitochondria. So most of what we do in the clinics to manage the disease most of the research that's being done throughout the world is probably a waste of time. Um, and I say that because we're not making any major progress in managing cancer. And that's because the theory of the disease is incorrect. And once people realize it's a metabolic mitochondrial problem, then you're going to see real achievements in reducing the deaths from cancer. So the greatest myth, cancer is a genetic disease, is a myth. Cancer is a mitochondrial metab metabolic disease, and that's the truth. What I appreciate about hearing that is so many of us feel like my father had this, my mother had that, my siblings, my grandparents, so then I'm probably doomed, and I'm afraid I'm going to get what they got. So I love hearing that cancer in particular is not genetic because that helps a lot of us with our anxiety and fear. And also what you're saying helps us feel like perhaps we have a little control of what's going on instead of just feeling like, oh my gosh, I got this diagnosis and now I got to trust in the doctors and, and I'm losing control of my body. Yeah. Well, I think you have to recognize there are genetic risk factors. Like you mentioned the BRCA1 and P53. These are risk factors. They only put you at risk if if those genes damage the function of the mitochondria. And, and no known genetic risk, inherited risk factor is 100% penetrant. Uh, even those who have BRCA1, the mutation that affects or breast cancer, you know, about 50 to 60% of women that would have that mutation uh, are at risk for developing cancer of the breast, but 40% are not. So you don't, you don't uh, and you can modify that by, by, by uh, things you can do to reduce the risk significantly. So there are genetic factors that are risk factors, but they're not the cause of the disease. Because if they were the cause, everyone that would inherit that mutation should get the disease, and that's clearly not the case. So, so yes, you are in charge 
of what you can do to reduce your risk. Even if you were diagnosed and said, oh, I have, like Ange you mentioned Ange Angelina Jolie. Well, she went out and had breasts and ovaries removed. Um, but if you could also use uh, diet and lifestyle modification to reduce the risk as well. So, uh, um, because it's not a fait accompli that if you have that mutation, you're gonna get the disease. It can be modified. So uh, um, uh, the only origin of cancer is damage to the mitochondria. If the, if the mitochondrial damage can be avoided, uh, cancer will be avoided. Oh, you just had me thinking. So do you think it's better to cut and chop, like take off our breasts and our ovaries or take out our prostate? Or should we maybe cut and chop food? Is it food? That well, can I, I don't, I, I certainly, if, if, if the mutations, uh, and besides, just because it, 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 it might involve, like the, the, most, the most, the highest prevalence for a, a genetic risk factor is the Lee from any P53 mutation, where about 80% of the people with that mutation will develop some form of cancer. 80, but not all. So it's not 100%. There's no mutation that we know of that causes cancer 100% of the time, which means, and, and P53 is a mutation that affects mitochondrial function. So clearly that, that gene damages the organelle that's responsible for the origin of cancer. Um, now, you know, you can remove organs, but with P53, but, but it, you could get cancer in almost any organ. Um, so what are you gonna do? I mean, you can't go out and, and remove all your organs to prevent you from, <laughs> right? Think about it, it doesn't make any sense. So, so but you can, do, you can try to reduce the risk because if you can keep your mitochondria healthy, uh, the probability of getting cancer is, is very rare, very, almost remote. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because every known cancer has damage to the mitochondria and they ferment, uh, they, they get their energy through, a, through a, non, uh, a, a, me a mechanism that doesn't involve oxygen. So they get energy without oxygen and that's called fermentation. And, um, you know, our, 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 our uh, primitive ancestors are what they call aboriginals, um, never, rarely, if ever had cancer. Uh, the, the great humanitarian Albert Schweitzer would look at the African populations and the jungles. They never had cancer. He never, never could find anyone with cancer. The, the investigation of the Eskimos and Native Americans, before um, Western civilization came into these, the lives of these people, Cancer was unheard of. Our closest genetic relative, the chimp, chimpanzee, is is ninety eight percent similar to us in genetic uh, background. They rarely, if ever, there's never been a documented case of breast cancer in a chimpanzee. So wh what's going on with this? Why are why are native uh, uh, ancestral humans and chimps and things they don't get cancer? So what is making all of us so susceptible to cancer, right? and it's diet and lifestyle. The Western diet and lifestyle is putting us at risk, not only for cancer, type two diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, dementia, all of the major chronic diseases, including cancer, are all the result of diet and lifestyle issues. We're, we're constantly bombarded with high fructose foods, uh, poorly nutritious foods. We don't exercise, uh, we're stressed out, uh, we're doing all these, all those kinds of things put us at risk for damaging the mitochondria in a population of cells, putting us at risk for cancer, okay? So the prevention of cancer is keep your mitochondria healthy. If you keep the mitochondria, how do you do that? Well, you, you, you do um, restricted food intake periodically, eat foods that are very low in carbohydrates. Don't forget our ancestors never had access to Hershey bars. Uh, or they never had a supermarket full of highly processed foods. They'd have to go out and kill what they ate or grow some vegetable that they could eat. They, were, they weren't uh, driving up to McDonald's and having somebody hand them a big happy meal through the window. And they don't even get out of the car. They don't even use the exercise to get out of the car to get the food. I mean, you try to compare that with trying to run down a, a big elephant and kill it and, 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 and butcher it. I mean, there's a lot of energy that goes into that and there's no sweet involved with that, right? <laughs> so think about it. those people never had cancer. They say, well, they didn't live long enough. Believe me, they did. There were some people that lived quite a long time and they never, so we already have documented, well-documented from a variety of different ways. Oh, they say these people never, our ancestors didn't, you know, when the Eskimos, they, they didn't go to doctors. That's not true. They love to go to doctors. This is reported by, by Robert Lufkin and some others. Um, 
or not Robert, but uh, um, uh, Sam Apple. And, and, and so we have plenty of evidence that cancer is a disease of civilization. We ourselves, our diets and lifestyles are putting us at risk. And, and so the way you can get away from this is, is try to adopt a diet lifestyle issue that reduces risk factors, right? Smoking. Smoking was a terrible risk factor for cancer. Now our society has come to realize that uh, we stopped smoking for the large part for many people and cancer rates went down tremendously. Okay, but right now, every day we have over 1,600 people a day dying from cancer in the United States, documented by the American Cancer Society. Every year they come out with their numbers. You know, how many new cases we have and how many people are dying from cancer. And you'll see the numbers are quite sobering. What is going on with 1,000 over almost now 1,700 people a day are dying from cancer? Um, and it doesn't go down, it goes up. And people say, well, well, it's going, it is, it's increasing at the same rate as the population is increasing, but there's no drop. We're not getting, we're not dropping death rates from cancer. All those drugs you hear about advertised on, on television, the Keytruda, the Optivo, chance to live longer, you know, do this and do that. It's all bullshit. It's all, ba it's all based on the somatic, the gene theory of cancer. If cancer is not a gene, if it's not a genetic disease, all that stuff is, is down. It's, not, it's never going to reduce significantly the death rate because the theory based on the treatments is, is incorrect. It's a metabolic disease. And we can take charge of that. We actually can, we, we have the capability of modifying our risk for cancer, type two diabetes, heart disease, all of these things. I mean, we have an obesity epidemic, right? Everybody knows this. They don't want to talk about it. Obesity is now re is replacing smoking as the number one risk factor for cancer. I mean, we have control of that. I mean, it's not easy, but you can control it. All the risk factors, most of the risk factors for cancer are now controllable when you understand that it's a metabolic disease and not a genetic disease. Because people who think it's a genetic disease say, oh, it's my bad luck. That's incorrect. It's incorrect. The mutations are all downstream effects. They're not the cause. So we're focusing in the, almost the entire cancer industry is focusing on downstream epiphenomena, not the real problem. So uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's what it is. We published a lot of papers on this. The problem is it's a message that few people want to hear. Certainly the pharmaceutical companies don't want to hear it. Certainly the academic cancer industry does not want to hear it. And also the, pay, the people, the population of people in our society are not really excited to hear about it. <laughs> they'll take, they'll roll the dice and say, oh no, I, I, I like to eat the way I am and I like to do what I like to do. I'm very comfortable and I'll roll the dice and maybe I won't get cancer. So, um, but they can take charge of it once you know how to manage it. So, and where it's origin, if you know how it starts, you know how to manage it. So it's not an insurmountable problem. It's just that, you know, we have people in the society that may not know this. So many questions, so many questions. So my first one is, <clears throat> you just mentioned number of people dying of cancer. How many are actually dying of cancer or the treatment? And there's a reason I'm asking it. It's regarding my father. Yeah, no, that's an extremely important question. And um, it's, it's a very interesting kind of question because I think a significant number of people treated are dying from the treatments. And um, let me give you a, a couple of, of examples. Well, first of all, you know that, that you know, if you're exposed to toxic poisons and radiation, that's not healthy. Uh, that for some people who are on the cusp of ill health, uh, that can push them over. Also, you also see many times they'll say he died from the complications of cancer, uh, which is often he died from the treatment. Um, now, in the Wall Street Journal, and I share this with my, my, my students, I tell my students in the cancer class and in my general biology, you get a lot of information on cancer from the Wall Street Journal. So um, for a variety of reasons, most of it's a new drug that's going to come out and see how much profit you can make on this new drug, uh, which is based on the gene theory, which is obviously not going to help my, many people in the first place. Um, but Paul Allen of Microsoft fame um, died uh, 
at Fred Hutch, I believe it was in Seattle. <clears throat> and the Wall Street Journal said the doctors were very optimistic about his prognosis. And within a couple of weeks, he was dead. And um, he died from the complications of whatever they treated him with. And he's one of the wealthiest guys in the world. And then um, Blake Nordstrom of the department store uh, chain, Nordstrom's department store. He had some sort of a lymphoma, according to the Wall Street Journal. The doctors were very optimistic. And within two weeks of his treatment, he was dead. You know, you don't die from cancer and lymphomas in two weeks, right? So, so what happens is the people that are rich and have a lot of money go off to their medical schools to get the latest treatments, okay? Uh, the poor people can't afford all that stuff. So they have a better chance of survival than the rich. They go off and they get all these special immunotherapies and all this kind of nonsense. And, and, and the next thing you know, uh, they, they do really well at the beginning. As a matter of fact, it looks like, whoa, miraculous. It's miraculous. As a matter of fact, it was shown, big paper published, that many of these drugs, they make the tumor look like it goes away, but you only live two extra months, 2.4 extra months. Can you believe it? I mean, we are so given so much misinformation by allowing drug companies to peddle their, their drugs on TV every night giving the false impression to the population that things are really hunky-dory. And, and if you have a, a cancer, we know how to treat your special cancer. We have the tools. Are you kidding me? We got 1,600 people a day dying. And, and yes, we have a lot of survivors. People say, oh, it must be worried. We have a lot of survivors, right? But a lot of those cancer survivors pay a, a terrible price for their survival. I mean, they're mu surgically mutilated. They're burned. They're poisoned. I mean, a lot of times they have all kinds of other maladies associated with the treatments that they were given. Oh yeah, I survived my cancer. You know, it was really tough battle, all this stuff. But now you have digestive issues, hormonal issues, neuropsychiatric problems. You got all kinds of problems for surviving your cancer. That's, that's nuts. You shouldn't have all that. That's nuts. What are they doing? So, um, and the answer is if cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease, we can drop the death rate by 50% in 10 years and we can bring people's health back. Not only will you, yes, of course, this is uh, clear, um, but oh, you, it's impossible. Of course, it's impossible if the theory that you're treating the patients with is incorrect. That, yes, it is impossible. But if the theory changes to a metabolic disease, yeah, very possible. The problem is no one has yet figured out a business model to make money on it. And until that happens, we must then be sacrificed uh, by the system uh, because we can't make money, enough money. Re revenue generation is the number one aspect of cancer. You got to generate revenue. Now, if I have a drug that can generate revenue and, and manage your cancer without toxicity, everybody will love it. But we don't have that. But we can manage your cancer without toxicity. The problem is we don't have, re we can't generate revenue on it. So these are, the, these, are the, these are the problems. And until the society steps back and says, yeah, we got to do something, it's going to be status quo. There's not going to be anything that's going to happen. So they're all going to run off to their Dana Farber's, MD Anderson's, Sloan Kettering's, Fred Hutch, whatever they go, wherever they go, um, MD Anderson's, right? They they run in there. They get all the different kinds of treatments, and they do good for a while. And then you hear, well, there's nothing more we can do. Uh, give me a break, you know? I mean, it's just it's just tragic. It is the greatest tragedy in the history of medicine. This cancer thing, and. Um, but you know, until we have to keep publishing the papers, we have to keep documenting all the case reports that we're showing. Oh, they say we don't have enough. I won't believe it unless I see a big case report. And then after you do a case report, they still won't believe it. So it's not, it has nothing to do. The outcome is why don't you look at all the case reports and how well they're doing and say, well, that's a fluke. He's a fluke. That's a fluke. This is a fluke. Well, one of these days, the patients are going to say, I want to be one of those flukes. So uh, the system has to change. If the system doesn't change, then it's going to be business as usual suffering, dying, and all this other stuff that's associated with the disease. And you know, it's a tragedy. People fear cancer. As soon as they get the word, I'm diagnosed with cancer, they impending doom and death. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way, yet it is, because they fear the treatment as much as they do the disease. And what, why? Oh, I'm gonna lose my breasts, I'm gonna lose my, my, my prostate gland, I'm gonna take my kidney out, take my lung out, they're gonna poison and irradiate me. Who the hell wants that? Oh, I got to do that if I want to survive, right? But you don't have, I can get, we can survive, you get you survive without having to do all that. Oh, I don't believe. Oh, okay, you don't believe. <laughs> I published all these papers. What part of it you don't believe? 
Oh, I never knew that. Oh, people say, I, I never saw that paper. Well, you don't read the damn literature. You know, if you read the literature, you'd be saying, oh, and you can't believe how many people say sugar has nothing to do with cancer. Now, sugar doesn't cause cancer. It's not a carcinogen. But if you have cancer and your blood sugar is high, you die faster. The tumor grows faster. It's clear. Hundreds of papers published. And then you go to an oncologist and sugar has nothing to do with cancer. What are you kidding me? These guys don't read the scientific literature. So I, I don't know what to say. I mean, what can you say? I'm on here talking on your show. I'm telling you and whoever's listening. Right? This is the way it is. They don't believe me. I'll sh then read my papers and see what you think. Right? If you say, I don't believe it. Well, hey, listen, there's a lot of people who, who actually believe stuff that, that is, is, is incomprehensible, and anybody could believe some of these things. But, they, what, you know, what are you going to say? But anyway, you can always look at my papers and read the information and see it if you don't believe what I'm saying. We're going to go over your papers in a moment. And I'm also going to ask you in a moment about Steve Jobs and pancreatic cancers, because I'd really like to go over the most dangerous cancers, but I'm going to tell a story real quick. <clears throat> the reason I asked you, because I have experience in this, how many are dying of cancer or the treatment? <clears throat> so when my dad got COVID, our whole family, except for me and one son, I guess, because we're O blood, I don't know, got the COVID in June of 2020. Now, my dad at the time, he's 80 now, totally fine for who he is. <laughs> he was 78, OB, sedentary, uh, prostate cancer, AFib, high blood pressure. I would, used to say high cholesterol, but now we know it's a myth and I'll talk to you about that in a moment. So my dad was at the hospital because his auction was 88. So God forbid he was dying of COVID. And what did I do? I said, mom, I don't know how this hospital treats it. I know Dr. Um, Thomas Yadigar at Tarzana Hospital in California, Cedar Providence. He knows what he's doing. He's saving tons of lives. We pull him out. My mom signs an AMA paper against medical advice. They warned us it might not be covered by insurance. We said, we don't care. Take him to Tarzana. He was there five days. The doctor said, basically, I'm not going to say who, a doctor who I spoke with said, you know, your dad was dying. I know the way this disease goes. They're treating him for pneumonia at that hospital. Here we treat for cytokine storm. Hmm. And I think a lot of what you're talking about, probably we can talk about cytokine storm. So that's why I asked you, a lot of people ran and did Certain, certain things to their body because they were so fearful. And I feel blessed. I didn't have to run and do anything. I said, you know what? I think if we go to the right doctor and we have the right hospital, we probably have a chance with COVID. But what I noticed, and, and what I noticed is not only was it obese people, and I talked to two lung specialists dealing with COVID, it was alcoholics. It was anyone inflamed. It was people currently going through cancer treatment. It was people who, I noticed bodybuilders, Professor, Dr. Seafried, it was bodybuilders, it was long distance runners, anyone who was overly doing it, like too fat, exercising too much, they probably had cytokine storm. So we'll talk about cytokine storm. And I'll get back to my other questions. You, do you talk about cytokine storm at all? Well, cytokine storm is, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's in, in the case of cancer, it would be uh, tumor lysis syndrome. And some people die uh, when, they get, when they get an immunotherapy uh, it, it can sometimes kill so many cancer cells together at the same time, they release a massive amount of, uh, it's a cytokine storm basically. And they die, they die quickly from that. So, um, you know, our approach is to grade the tumor slowly over time using the press pulse metabolic therapy. So we completely avoid any cytokine storm or light tumor lysis syndrome. But, but, you're, but you're, uh, you're correct in defining that many of the people that did suffer and die from COVID, most of them had some sort of comorbidity uh, uh, with, with their condition, whether they were older or even younger people that are immunocompromised or, or um, obese, or there was a whole slug of things that would be put you at risk. And again, where did all those people develop the risk for being killed by COVID? The diet and lifestyle issue. It comes right back to the fact that if you're young and healthy and, and, in, and in not overly uh, great shape, like you mentioned with some of these, some of these people, um, the probability of dying from COVID was much less than people that had all these comorbidities. And most of those comorbidities have come from diet and lifestyle issues. And those, many of the comorbidities also put people at risk for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and high blood pressure, hypertension, all these other kinds of things as well. So everything comes back to metabolic homeostasis within the body. And uh, if, you're if you have metabolic homeostasis, you're, you're more likely to survive a variety of different assaults on the body. 
So again, we're going to get back to the dangerous cancers and Steve Jobs in a moment because I don't I don't want to leave that question hanging. But I think a question people are going to say right now. But Professor Dr. Seafried, what about the two year old child? What about the teen? And I'll, I'll ask a question. I'll, I'll give um, from my friend. She said, "I lost a 16 year old daughter seven years ago to small round cell." Desmoplastic sarcoma, a very rare cancer. She was diagnosed at 14. What could have been wrong with her metabolically to have caused this? What could we have done differently? Yeah, well, you know, the, how, how that initial uh, uh, disruption of the mitochondria happens can sometimes be easily determined and sometimes less easily determined. So for a 14-year-old girl to have a mitochondrial abnormality in a population of, of cells that, that ultimately grew out of control is, is not clear uh, in, that, in that case. In other words, what, she, what could that young lady have done to prevent herself from getting that cancer? Again, at 14 years old, and most of the young people, they don't, they don't really think about themselves getting cancer, nor do, nor do the, pa the parents of those kids. The, the issue is, is what could have been done to help her survive in a, more, uh, uh, a less toxic way. Now, metabolic therapy that I speak about we don't call that a cure for cancer. We call it a logical management uh, of the disease. If you happen to survive very long periods of time, like into your 80s and 90s and happen to die from a stroke, then you can possibly say that metabolic therapy that was treating my cancer when I was 14 or 20 or whatever was probably cured because obviously the guy died from something else in his 90s. So you don't know. People say, oh, I, as a cure, we don't think about cure for cancer. What you think of is, is a logical management of cancer. So, so um, that's what we think of when, when we say, oh, how, how do you cure? We don't cure, we, we, we manage. Can you manage the disease without creating toxicity? So the 14 year old girl, I can't tell you how she might have gotten the origin of that, but we would certainly have a logical strategy for managing it, whether, whether she could have been cured or not, she probably would not have died in such a rapid way um, or, or in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a difficult way. So, so we're working on all that. And once we, we already, we already have the blueprint plan. I, I, I'm sure we can keep most of these cancer patients alive far longer with a higher quality of life and overall survival. Whether they're cured or not, I don't know. We've only been doing this for a while. Um, I mean, we've got eight, nine, 10 year survivors, but, but you know, are they cured? Who knows? I mean, if they die from old age from something else, then oh, yeah, they were cured. But who's going to, I won't be around to see those people. They might live longer than me. So what am I going to say? <laughs> you know, you were talking about rich people getting the best treatment, yet sometimes it kills them faster. So I was thinking about <laughs> That's Steve a, Jobs. That, you encapsulated that pretty clearly, didn't you? <laughs> I'm sorry, we're laughing. That's a, but... ter that's a terrible thing to say, right? <laughs> terrible but that's what scares us the most this is the boogeyman that's why i have you on the wow. show to help people from the anxiety and stress thinking the boogeyman's going to come to get me if someone like a steve jobs gets a pancreatic cancer and he can't live then surely i'm not going to live so can you talk to us either about pancreatic cancers or just the most dangerous cancers in general that seem to have no cure yeah well when 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 you cure well you know it's surgery if you can catch a cancer early like the size of a wart and surgically debulk it you're probably cured so uh, it's when they metastasize and start to spread to other tissues and, and, and around the environment, which then becomes a little bit, uh, a much greater challenge. Um, but Steve Jobs, I, I, he had pancreatic cancer. He lived quite a long, I, I don't know what kind of ca uh, pancreatic cancer he might've had, but I, I know he, he said he was doing some um, dietary stuff. Uh, but for those who have pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma in the brain, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, all these kinds of cancers, the, the, it metastasizes quickly and spreads around the, the body. But what we know is that they are all similar. Uh, I did a big study on this. I compared the underlying problem in all of the major cancers that we know of, which includes about 99% of all major cancers, pancreatic, glioblastoma, lung, all these different cancers, bladder, colon, breast, they all, they all generate energy by um, using the, without oxygen, which is called fermentation. And then once you understand that energy can be generated by breathing air or by these cells get energy without breathing, 
So they live in hypoxic, non, uh, non-oxygen environments. But in order to live in that environment, they have to, fer- you call fermentation. It's an ancient pathway of energy before oxygen came into the atmosphere two, 2.5 billion years ago. So the cancer cell is doing nothing more than falling back on an ancient pathway of energy metabolism, depending on um, two fuels, glucose, the sugar, and the amino acid glutamine. So if you pull the plug on those two fuels, you can manage the majority of cancers, as long as you transition the body over to ketone bodies, which are fat break, water-soluble fat breakdown products. So the, the solution to the cancer problem is not that complicated. You just take these people, you deprive the tumors of their very ne- necessary fuels and trans- while transitioning the body over to fuels that cannot be fermented. So it, it's, it's actually embarrassingly uncomplicated. Uh, but when you look at cancer from the perspective of a genetic disease, it's hopelessly complicated. So um, once you understand the metabolism of what's driving the growth of the tumor, whether it's a pancreatic tumor, a glioblastoma, a bladder cancer, lung, any of them, they all ferment. So the, the plan to eliminate them or manage them becomes much more clear and less, far less toxic. So that's the strategy. Our case reports that we are writing over and over again on individuals uh, demonstrate that people that should be dead are alive. There's a movie that will be coming out uh, called The Cancer Revolution. It's, I think they're going to the, um, uh, one of those uh, documentary film, film fests, I think in uh, uh, somewhere in Utah with, where they have those, doc, those film documentaries. Anyway, um, in there, they've interviewed uh, many long-term survivors of the most deadly cancers that have used metabolic therapy to manage their disease. And everybody writes them off as flukes or anecdotal and things like this. But it's only a matter of time before more and more and more of these kinds of cases start appearing everywhere. And the people who survive start telling everybody, you know, how wonderful I'm doing and all this. And then people will say, I want to be one of those flukes. I want to be one of those anecdotes. And then the, 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 the oncologists at the hospital say, we don't do that. Um, we don't treat you like that. In fact, they get angry and they, they, they want you to do their standard of care. So, so th- this system is going to ch- has to change. How many people uh, w- want to continue with what we're doing? How many people are, are satisfied with the progress that we have made in managing cancer when we have over 1,600 people a day dying from the disease? How many people are happy with the fact that, they're, that they have to subject themselves to surgical mutilation, radiation, and poisons? I don't think there's a lot of people that feel good about that. Nobody gets into a happy state when they get diagnosed with cancer. So I, I, I'm not saying that with metabolic therapy or that you're going to be, oh, wow, I have cancer now. Now maybe I can get rid of my high, high blood pressure, diabetes, along with the cancer. So, and that's what we're seeing. A number of people that come in to do metabolic therapy for cancer uh, have diabetes and high blood pressure and all these other things, and they all go away with the tumor. So um, Guy Tannenbaum, you should, you should interview this, this gentleman, advanced prostate cancer, he had nine months to live, they said. He's out now uh, three years and he's doing uh, remarkably well. He lost uh, 110 pounds. He got rid of his high blood pressure, his type two diabetes, hypertension, got rid of it all, and his prostate cancer. And, and um, pe- people say, oh, I wanna do what Guy does. Well, Guy, Guy did water only fasting for like 10 or 12 days at a time. Uh, with intermittent um, keto. And, and so, uh, well, okay, I, I don't want to do what guy's doing. Okay, then take the chemo and radiation, get your prostate pulled out. <laughs> I mean, these are the choices, right? So, um, but, you know, more and more people are going to say, and he, he's on the web telling everybody how healthy he is. He feels great. He's wonderful. Never felt better in his life. You know, it's like, so, um, so it's, a, it's a metabolic therapy which can manage not only cancer, but a lot, of the, a lot of the conditions that put the body at risk for developing a neoplasia or, or, or a tumor in the first place. So, um, but you know, people say, oh, if that's so true, how come everybody doesn't wanna do this? How come everybody doesn't know about it? And the answer is, you, t- you, if you ask how many people would really bite the, bite the bullet and compliance and say, oh, I gotta, eat, I gotta eat a diet now that has zero carbohydrates. And I do, I test it right with my students, myself and stuff. I mean, it's great for the first week or two. And after a while you go, wow, I man, this is really tough or water only fasting. You have to change your mindset. The mind 
the mind body relationship has to begin to change. The motivation is you want to stay alive. The goal is how long can I stay alive with a, a diagnosis of cancer? Um, how can I, can I manage my own disease with the help of knowledgeable professionals who can guide me through the gauntlet of what I need to do to maintain control of the growth of these cells. And I want to degrade them uh, um, slowly over time. And that's, what me that's metabolic therapy. So ketogenic metabolic therapy will be eventually the solution to the cancer problem. But it's gonna take a while for the, for the system to recognize that and change. It's, it's gonna happen. Uh, unless people are very happy with the way things, the status quo. Um, and if they are, then take the radiation and chemo and immunotherapies and all that other stuff. You know, I would never do that, but maybe somebody else would do that. I don't know. <laughs> My friend Davi actually sent me some videos on, from Guy Tenenbaum. And what I saw is he, at some point in his cancer, he did a 45 day water fast. So he had to add vitamins or some certain food. I think no, he did 35 no. days of something, no? Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't 45 days. It, it, I think he, he, when he came into my office here, he was, he was on an 18 day water only fast. Oh. Now, isn't you, don't he... go out, you don't go out and do that. Uh, that's like saying, oh, I want to run a marathon. Uh, let, let me run, let me, did you practice it all? No, no, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I weigh 300 pounds. I want to do a 26 mile run. How do you think that's going to go? <laughs> Not well, right? So uh, a guy, Tannenbaum, did small fasts at the beginning. Mm -hmm. He built yeah. his body up into a tolerance routine. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was eating, he, he then would start to eat uh, the kinds of foods that would be extremely low glycemic, highly nutritious kinds of foods. Um, and he balanced his his uh, his body. So, uh, um, but he, he is a survivor, uh, long-term survivor, who uh, got rid of a lot of other conditions that he had, but he's not alone. I mean, we have many people that are, are, are doing this. Um, you know, you, you just have to know, uh, we developed the glucose ketone index calculator to allow cancer patients to know whether they're in the therapeutic, whether they're in this therapeutic zone. And, and then once they get into that therapeutic zone, then we give them certain low dose drugs that uh, work together uh, with this new metabolic state to, to, to precision kill tumor cells. Our metabolic therapy is the real precision medicine. What it does is it enhances the health and vitality of your normal cells while killing tumor cells without toxicity. That's precision medicine, not this immunotherapy crap and all these other crazy things you hear. They're all based on a, flaw, a, a flawed theory. When the theory is wrong, those things are not going to be, yes, they will help some people, but they're not going to help the majority of people that have all these different kinds of cancers metabolic therapy will be able to manage cancer in the majority of people, okay? But they need to know what to do and how to do it. They need to have professionals that will guide them, uh, 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 consult them and show them what they should do and what they should not do. It should be a feed forward feedback between the patient and, and the caregiver. The problem is we have very few physicians that understand anything about what I just said. They're clueless as to recognize the biology of the disease they're treating. They don't know cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. How could you treat somebody for a disease when you have no clue as to the biology of the disease you're treating? So there has to be a real educational. There has to be trained people that understand. Cancer is a metabolic disease. How are we gonna help all these people use, uh, and you have to get people that buy onto this. They, you have to have people that are motivated to want to do this. Listen, there are some people, no matter what you say, they can't give up food for, for five hours, right? okay, we have radiation and chemo for you, okay? We, we're not gonna take that away for those people that lack willpower and self-discipline. We definitely have the radiation, chemo, immunotherapies. We'll be more than happy to treat you that way. But for those people that wanna take charge of their own soul and existence, we have another alternative uh, approach that you might wanna consider once you become educated enough and work with an individual that understands the concepts. Makes sense, right? Right? I mean, what's, this doesn't make sense to people. I don't know. I mean, we, we, we consider it the, 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 new, the new way to view cancer. So we don't ever want to stop somebody from taking radiation or chemo. I mean, if that's what they desire, we think that should always be available for that, for that. So we don't want to say, oh, people should never be irradiated or treated with toxic poisons to kill their tumor. You know, if that's part of the standard of care, you know, uh, some people say, you know, I, I, I think I need radiation and I, I think I need a lot of chemo. Okay, okay, well, it'll be there for you. But for those people who don't want it, 
why don't we tell them? Right now, the system does not allow people to, to recognize that there is another way to manage cancer that is non-toxic, but it requires a lot of personal discipline. And you, you know, if the person, well, I don't have any personal discipline, great, then you do the standard of care. So, the, but the alternative should be there and it should be, uh, uh, people should know about it. At least they have the option. I'm not saying people should do metabolic therapy any more than I should say they should do the standard of care. Whatever they think they should, in their particular uh, lifestyle and the way they view it, they should have the choice, or at least they should know about it and weigh, compare and contrast uh, what, what should be done for managing their particular condition. So right now they get no choice. It's, e it's either this, this way or the highway, standard of care or the highway. You, know, you don't really have any other, any other options. And when you ask most oncologists, is there another way? No, no, this is the way it is. So, uh, and that's wrong. They, there should be options. To, they should be given options too. What I appreciate most about all of the lectures and everything I've read that you've written and all your thoughts is that once we get a scary diagnosis, especially cancer, we feel like friends throw things at us, doctors throw things at us, neighbors, everyone's giving us yeah. their opinion and we don't know where to go. Who do I trust? Yeah. What do I do? So what's interesting, I'm going to relate this to what just happened to my dad. So my dad has COVID-19 right now for the second time. He's 80 now. And he went to the hospital. They said, you're COVID positive. And they gave him a pill by Merck called Le Legevero, something like that. So I look, it says, released by emergency use, experimental, and it says, not FDA approved. <laughs> so yeah. I said, dad, hey, let's, let's read the product insert. What are the long-term side effects? What are the short-term side effects? We don't know. So it's a very similar thing with cancer. We get a lot thrown at us. Do we, do we, do we even look at the, the product insert to know what we're putting in our body, the injection, the radiation, the pill, the, the treatment? So I appreciate that it sounds like you're teaching us we have a little more control than we think. Yeah, we, we do. But the pro you're, you raised an extremely important point because there are a lot of medications um, that can target the energy metabolism of the cancer cells with minimal side effects, like embendazole and fenbendazole, these parasite medications, um, which are really cheap uh, and they're very effective and very non-toxic. Um, uh, but you, again, you have to know how to use this. And there's many drugs that are not FDA approved that could have be extremely powerful when used under nutritional ketosis. Uh, we've tested them, uh, the drug uh, 6-deoxynorleucine, uh, which is D-O-N, Don. I've spoken about this. We used it here in the clinic or in our preclinical models. And they, we got really, really good results. It's a glutamine targeting drug. Um, and it really works well, but it's, the, again, it was used on children with cancer, people with cancer that in the past, and they said, oh, it was too toxic, didn't work. Well, you gave it a too high of a concentration, you didn't know how to use it, and you weren't targeting the glucose at the same time you were targeting the glutamine. So it's, it, 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 you're not gonna get the complete effect efficacious uh, be, uh, control if you don't know how to use the drug that you're working with, again. But now it's not for human use. All I can say is if I were diagnosed with cancer, I would be get myself into nutritional ketosis as fast as possible. I would buy Don. I, I, I would get it from a, a, a company. I know where to get it. And people can get it. Their problems, they won't sell it to you, but I can get it. Uh, well, how can I get it? Well, I, I can get it in different ways. Um, I've tested drugs from China. I've tested them to make sure the ones, because you know some of that stuff may not be good. I test the ones that are good. So uh, um, yeah, and I would have one of my friends deliver it to me, IV, right? And I would take all the things that I've been working and I see all my clinical stuff. The problem is people can't, like your, your viewers, they wouldn't be able to do that. But I know people who have enough, some people have a lot of money, so I wanna do that. I'll say, okay, you can buy the drug and then you just gotta find a clinician that will uh, sign off and say, okay, what are you worried about? You think Don is gonna be as toxic as some of those immunotherapies that are killing people? I mean, it, it, you, you gotta put things into perspective. People say, oh, the ketogenic diet has a lot of adverse effects. Like what? Like compared to radiation? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I got to stop eating carbs. It's going to be worse than, than, than me taking a toxic poison. <laughs> I mean, this is nuts, right? So the, it's the mindset of the people. So, uh, um, but yeah, no, no, we have, there's a plan. We wrote the press pulse concept. It was a, a strategy. You have that paper there um, with my physician colleagues. And uh, um, yeah, this stuff will work, man. It's it just got, you just got to educate people 
and um, and and the physicians. You have to educate the, the 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 physicians and the patients together, and then you start to see big big changes. Um, you can get my papers and read them. So press pulse was a strategy by which we use a diet to stress the tumor cells, and then very low doses of drugs um, pulsed to kill off the survivors. So it's a it's a logical strategy for gradually degrading of the tumor population while enhancing the health and vitality of the normal body. So uh, it's not to be viewed as a, uh, a bull in a china shop, like let's irradiate this poor guy until, or this organ until it's like incinerated. Uh, why are you doing that? Well, I wanna get rid of the cancer cells. But why don't you just slowly degrade them by, by starving them to death of the energy that they need using a press pulse metabolic therapy? Well, I didn't know anything about that. Well, why don't you read the paper and then discuss it with your oncologist? So the patient comes in, he says, oh, wow, I discussed it my, with my oncologist. And then my oncologist said, we don't do that. So now what? So the poor patient is always left in this limbo that, uh, that doesn't know what he should do, he or she should do. Yet the, the strategy is there, but the very professional that's supposed to help him go, th go through this doesn't understand the concept. So you have all of these issues that are uh, standing in the way of having a very logical, non-toxic way to manage almost everyone's cancer, most of the people. We, we should be able to manage our, our, our cancers in a very logical strategy using press pulse metabolic therapy, uh, which, we, which we published. So it was a skeleton outline. We're working on a big paper right now, which is really a protocol for treating the patients with metabolic therapy. So I'll, I'll have a lot of my physician colleagues with me, working with me on that paper so that we can, again, put it out into open access. Have the, can the cancer patient wave this paper in front of their oncologist and say, please do this for me. It's clearly outlined what you need to do, doses, timing, and scheduling. Please do this for me. And what they do is chase you out of the office. They don't, they, they're trained to do only, only the standard of care. And they're not trained. And then you get these other guys who, oh yeah, who, who, have, who, who say, well, we're going to give you a whole bunch of uh, supplements and all this crazy stuff like snake oils and all this nutty stuff. But oh yeah, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna use toxic poisons, but we're gonna give a whole bunch of supplements. Like what? How is that gonna target glucose and glutamine? How is that gonna put you in a state of therapy? So so you got it, and you are hundred percent, Amalia, where the poor care, cancer patient goes. He gets all this misinformation, right? He goes to the top medical school, gets misinformation. He goes to some alternative guy and gets misinformation. So, so the poor guy is, like you said, he said, she said, oh, do this, do that, don't do this, don't eat that, don't eat that. And it's all, it's like so confusing for the cancer patient. We, we know exactly pretty much what you need to do. We publish the papers, but we can't find, it won't be adapted by the medical establishment. So uh, again, we have the same, to some, agree, some extent, the same kind of problem. You know, we can't get the word out to the people or the me me methods for doing that. Anyway, you know, it's a struggle, but um, eventually in some point in the future, it will happen. So uh, it just takes time. You just have to, 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 to hope that it happens sooner than later. Do you see your book? I pulled it up. Can you not see the screen? So I, I remember last time you had a, you had a press screen. Oncology, but I, that's, that's our, I think that's our most recent paper, but it's not the one that the press pulse metabolic therapy. Don't worry. I mean, the, the people, people can get all of our stuff on open access. So uh, there is interesting, one paper I published recently though on, pro, on prostate cancer um, uh, in Nature Urology. So Nature is like one of the top uh, scientific journals. Uh, the problem with that paper is that you have to have a subscription to Nature to get the paper. So most people are never going to see it. Um, oh, published in a very prestigious journal, but nobody can read it. So what good, what good is it? <laughs> it's, not as, it's not as important as the open access papers. So you, you, can, you can see all that. Yeah, I, I see the frontiers thing here, but that's our new paper in, uh, in brain cancer. Okay, uh, what about, do you see the one with uh, managing breast cancer, ketogenic metabolic uh, therapy? I don't see it on my screen, but. Hmm, but strange. Uh, okay, can you tell us about that? It's, it's in Frontiers articles. It says consideration of ketogenic metabolic therapy as a complementary or alternative approach to managing breast cancer. Yeah, well, I mean, all, it can, I, could, I could have put substituted that with lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, bladder cancer, you know, lung cancer, um, because they'll all respond in a similar way. Uh, someone reached out to me in the breast cancer field, and I have a lot of friend, uh, physician friends who are working on breast cancer. 
and some of the results on, on, on some of these women are unbelievable. Um, you know, people with me advanced metastatic breast cancer that, that goes to the lungs and the brain. You know, when you have your metastatic cells leaving the primary site of the tumor and then spreading to other organs like the liver and the lung and the brain, that's pretty much uh, lights out. But um, we use metabolic, my colleagues use metabolic therapy and we're able to keep these people alive so much longer in a much higher. And then what we, what we need to do is, and they go through, a lot of them go through standard of care and so beat up, it's just unbelievable. You know, they're, they're emaciated and all this. And then we still sometimes can rescue. We can't rescue some people. Some people are so badly damaged from the toxic treatments that their normal cells can no longer rally. Mm -hmm. And because uh, don't forget, metabolic therapy relies on our normal cells as com direct competitors with the tumor cells. So um, if you keep your normal cells healthy and strong, they'll outcompete the tumor cells, which will be are much weaker because of all the problems they have genetically and metabolically. So it's a, it's a struggle. The normal cells struggle against the tumor cells, but you got to keep the normal cells healthy and you got to keep the pressure on the tumor cells and gradually degrade them. They gradually start dying off. As your body starts getting healthy, the tumor cells gradually, because you're using diet drug cocktails. The tumor cells cannot survive under those diet drug cocktails. You're, you're taking away the two fuels needed for their growth and survival, the glucose and the glutamine. And once you do that, while keeping the rest of the body healthy, these damn tumor cells up and die on you. Now people say, whoa, wow, how can you do that? I published these papers. Why don't you look at the data and tell me what, tell me what you think, <laughs> you know? I love it. I'm going to pull up another one of your papers. How about metabolic management of microenvironment acidity and glioblastoma? Well, that's our newest paper. Um, that just goes to show that, you know, why is it so hard to manage glioblastoma? Now, don't forget, glioblastoma is pretty much a death sentence for most people that have it, right? Uh, John McCain passed away of glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. President Biden's son, Bo Biden, died of glioblastoma, right? Uh, 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 Edward Kennedy, Massachusetts Senator Edward Kennedy. I mean, these are high profile folks. Um, and if there were a solution to those to the problem, don't you think those guys would have been ones to get it? Uh, but they're all dead from it. But you know, they go into high dose radiation and chemo and all this crazy stuff. And it creates an acidic microenvironment that, that actually allows the tumor cells to survive even better. So as soon as that first they, they survived that first radiation blast. It's like the worst thing you can do to a brain cancer patient is irradiate them. The, uh, and yet they do it over and over again. And I tell them, I told them, you're contributing to the demise of the patient by doing that. And you think that would have echoed with somebody's ear? No, no, got to keep doing that. And I pointed, oh, I never heard of that. I didn't know radiation could make the tumor grow faster because you don't read the damn literature. We published all these papers showing that the, the radiation frees up the two fuels that the tumor cell absolutely needs to, uh, to, to grow. And, and, uh, and you guys making it worse. And they say, well, we, would, we didn't hear about that. We didn't have that in medical school. Well, I said, whose problem is that? You know, that's your problem, not mine. I published the papers to show you how this is all working. And all your patients are dying, right? Why don't you look at the survival? You know, 15 months, if you can make 15 months with a glioblastoma, you're doing really well, you know? And yet they, they do it over and over again, expecting a different result. What did Einstein call that? He called it insanity doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. When is the field? We have not made a single advance in glioblastoma in 100 years. Think about this. We have the Webb telescope orbiting a million miles from Earth, looking at the origin of the solar system. And we still have no advance in the glioblastoma field. Can you believe this? Why? Because the theory under which they're treating the patients is incorrect. You're never gonna get any advance if you keep doing the same stupid thing over and over again. You know, it just, it's just like nuts. You know, after a while, I say to myself, maybe I'm going insane. <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, you can see the clear, it's so clear if you understand what's going on. And yet it's, you know, I don't know what you have to do to these, to, to change the system. But, um, but I'm telling you what you need to do. I'm telling you how you do it. I'm giving the hard scientific evidence to support what I'm saying and all the publications that we want, that we do. And you can see how many hundreds, thousands of people looking at our stuff, you can see, you can throw it up there and see how many thousands of views I see, you know. Oh, 85,000 people looked at my paper mm -hmm. and yet did not make one single change in the clinic as the result of the information that I put out there. Now, what's going on with that? 
They're locked into the system. The system prevents them. There's a lot of very good physicians out there that would love to change this. They, they can't do it. The system will not allow them to do it. So you have to change the system. How are you going to change the system, right? What's the way to change the system? Educate the people. They're the consumers. They're the ones who have to go down and get the treatments from the physicians at the uh, oncology centers. If they say, I want metabolic therapy, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, they say, well, we don't do that. Well, I'll go somewhere where I can get it done. Okay. So, so again, the, and also you have, people have to be, they have to understand that it's their soul, it's their, it's their survival. So it obviously means a lot. It should mean a lot to them. You think they would want to go out and, and learn much, as much as possible about this, you know? So, because it's ultimately, it's their destiny that's under, that's under, uh, 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 under evaluation here. So, yeah, there's a lot of things, but I keep, you know, we, 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 we get a lot of good support from, uh, from private foundations and philanthropy. It keeps my lab going strong uh, so I can continue to publish this, publish these papers until I'm blue in the face. Eventually somebody's going to look and say, yeah, these guys were right all the time. Why, why didn't we ever do that? <laughs> and you say, yeah, well, we told you a long time ago how, how to manage this cancer, but you guys didn't want to didn't want to take it up. So, um, but that's okay. Uh, we'll just keep pushing forward. So that reminds me, everything you're saying, it's, it's really hard for doctors sometimes, even if they want to do what, what you're showing through studies. Like for example, the doctor that gave my dad the new Merck pill, Legevero, and Pfizer just came out with Pavlovid, I think. When you look at, if you just have to read the prescribing information, the insert that normally comes in the packaging, and you see that it's brand new. We don't know your short and long-term side effects. We don't even know if, if it's going to stop your COVID, start something else. We have no idea, but we're just, the doctors have to do it because these huge bodies like FDA, CDC, WHO, NIH say, this is what we're, this is what we're pushing now. And if you just yeah, open no, it I mean, and read I it. I can't speak for the drugs that are going to be used against COVID. Um, because I haven't tested any of this and I know very little about, about that. But I mean, we certainly can know about the drugs for cancer. Um, there's a lot of information on that. It's mostly incredible toxicity. Um, but what your father is taking to manage COVID, you know, I, I have no knowledge about that drug at all and um, can't speak to it at all or know what the adverse effects or the long-term consequences are of that. But what's can, interesting is when I ask my lung doctor friends, two of them, who specialize in COVID, I say, how's COVID today? They say, basically, nobody's dying. So why are people taking this experimental emergency use unapproved pill? Yeah, that, nobody's dying that, today, supposedly. I mean, I'm sure some still are. That, that's a different question. You yeah. know, why are you giving someone a drug that if, if, if they don't need it? Yeah. Uh, but that's, you know, uh, neither here nor there. But, but you know, I, I'm, I focus mostly on, the, on the, the, the cancer problem. So I think if we can solve that problem, and I think we can, uh, once the word... Uh, once people start understanding what the nature of the disease is, um, then I think we're going to make big, big breakthroughs. Um, so I've always looked at cancer as, as a ver it's very bright. If the future is, if once they change the, 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 what, what the view of what the nature of the disease is and realize that it's a metabolic disease, then that the, the approach to managing it becomes, wow, you can use a lot of different things that won't harm the person to manage the disease. So beautiful diet drug combos, um, yeah, you're not going to get rid of it tomorrow, but, but by uh, six or eight, 10 months down the road, you're, 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 you're back with in, in top health again, and you have this thing under control. So uh, um, this is the future. But um, Amalia, I have no idea uh, when that's going to become standard of care. When I even wrote a paper, you know, uh, for glioblastoma, metabolic therapy, <laughs> standard of care, for, uh, metabolic therapy should be the standard of care for glioblastoma. But, uh, and for all cancers, as a matter of fact, but, but um, see if who I can knows? find that one. The medic, yeah. is that the metabolic management of microenvironment, acidity and glycerin? No, that's, that's the new one, but it, you know, it covers the same stuff um, that you, we just published that a couple of, it just published a few weeks ago. Is it the one ketogenic metabolic therapy? Because I do have a question about that. Can you tell us about foods? You know, there are people that feel, you know, they're going to get control of their stress or God forbid, preventing cancer, being vegan. Some people now say, you know, I want to be carnivore or ketogenic. Your paper right here that I have up on the screen says ketogenic metabolic therapy without chemo or radiation for the long-term management of basically glioblastoma. So what, what do you say in general for dangerous cancers or general cancers for food? Is it vegan? Is it meat? Is it keto, paleo? 
Well, we use the glucose ketone index calculator in which that patient, Pablo Kelly, uh, who's on the web telling everybody how he survived eight years uh, with a, a glioblastoma. Mm. Um, but he, he went into a carnivore. At first, he just did uh, zero carbohydrate dieting, some small amount of fasting. Then he started to shift over more to a carnivore uh, kind of diet. And uh, he was taking various kinds of small supplements. But, but the, the bottom line was that he uh, learned to manage his cancer. Uh, he, he never went, he never took um, radiation or chemo, uh, which, you know, knocks the hell out of your body. And, and as I said, if you, if, if the human brain should rarely, if ever be irradiated, what are you doing to these poor people? So he chose not to do that. We can manage cancer without irradiating the brain. Uh, you know, once you shut off the blood vessels and starve the tumor cells of their glucose and glutamine, uh, using the glucose ketone index calculator, which Pablo did. So every day he would take a, a prick of uh, blood from his fingertip and then look at, measure the glucose in his blood and measure the, the ketone body, the ketones in his blood, and you get a nice ratio. And the closer you can keep that ratio one to one, the better you are in killing and suppressing the growth of those tumor cells. So he had a, he had a handle, he knew, he knew. And then, and then what he did he realized that, oh, my tumor is really under control. Um, you know, I'm, I'm out, I, I was supposed to be dead like two years ago and here I'm still alive. His tumor was continuing to grow, but at a very, very slow pace. So then he said, okay, after three years, I'll have it cut out. Uh, at first it was an inoperable brain cancer. And then all of a sudden with three years of metabolic therapy, it became an operable tumor. Uh, so the, the neurosurgeon says, I can take this out. So they went in and took it out. And then he said, oh, now I should go back on my, but they never took it all out. There was always some remaining. So, and then all of a sudden he started like drifting off his uh, rigid therapy. And then it started growing again. It put the fear of God back into him. So he went back down into the glucose ketone index calculator and learned to live with it. Now he's had a second debulking. Uh, it grows so slow. You know, glioblastoma grows so fast, usually kills you within a year or two, you know? This guy's out eight years and he, the tumor is like, he's learned to live with it. Every, every three, four years, he has it, a little piece of it taken out. And, but he would have, should have been dead years ago. He has now two kids um, and he's, he's very happy with his life, but he's a little under some restriction here, but he knows what he needs to do. You know, it's not like, uh, so, and, and a lot of people are like this. They're just managing their cancer. They're learning to live with it. And, um, and then sometimes with the right drug, drug diet combo, you can knock it out completely that you're considered cancer free. But who knows, you know? All I know is that the person is alive today that should have been dead a long time ago. Um, and that's all we know. So we can't say the guy is cured. We can't say this. All we know is he's alive when 90% he, when, when of the people with that cancer are dead. So, uh, um, or more, you know, so, um, but, but any event, yeah, so um, uh, there's ways to do this. There's ways to, to manage this. I know you got to go soon. So just a few more questions. You know, I had Dr. Danaberg. Do you want to get it real quick? We can pause. You need to get the oh, um That's okay. I'll, I'll pick it up later. Okay. The, the, we get so many people emailing me for information uh, and I give them free, free information. Uh, kits, uh, all the papers, uh, they sit down with their family and, and they discuss this information. At least it gives them the knowledge of an alternative approach and they can, they can do with it what they want. Um, so uh, it, every cancer patient should be uh, fully aware of the nature of their condition, uh, what should be done and, and how to do it and what are the options. I mean, that's all. And if you have the knowledge, then you, every family can make and the patient can make their own choices as to the strategy they would like to use to manage their condition. How do people get the kits? They email me. And what I do is, and then there's a, uh, at the end of the kit, there's a, uh, if they wanna make a donation to one of the foundations that supports our research, uh, um, they, they're, they're, they, they can do that. So, and I don't, I don't even, I just say, if you feel that the information in this kit helps you, yeah, um, you, you might want to make a, a donation. Uh, but if it doesn't help them, then it's, I don't pressure anybody. I mean, they, they, if they feel that they've been helped, um, they can, they, they can make a donation. If not, you know, it's just up to them. But, you know, you know, this is the, um, this is the situation. 
so so anyway yeah so we do a lot of this and and um you know i'm publishing papers all but i also teach all the classes here at boston college we have a big big classes that i teach so it's a it's an active um, active participation in all these things since the, i think uh, it seems like i know a lot i do know three people that died of glioblastoma multiform. And there's quite a few in my life over the years that have lymphoma. So do you mind if I ask a question from one of my friends who's currently dealing with it? Yeah. Okay. If you specifically have swollen lymph nodes in the groin, what technique can be used to reduce them, even if they are six centimeters wide? Any techniques besides, because this is what she's been doing, besides eliminating processed sugar and foods, reducing all natural sugar and fruits, regular exercise, yoga, eight to 10 hours of sleep daily, one half of your body weight in ounces, prayer and positive thoughts. So she's saying other than all that stuff she's doing, what, what do you have to say to people like that? She's doing that, all that stuff right now? Yeah. Okay. Then she should measure her glucose ketone index. And how do people do that? They buy the, you can go on, uh, on Amazon and get the, uh, the meter, the keto mojo meter. Okay. Uh, We have a couple of them there. You can buy, you know, keto mojo is one of them. Um, And then that you take the, you prick your finger like a diabetic would, and you get a drop of blood. And, uh, and then you can take the little ketone stick or the glucose stick and you can get your glucose blood sugar and you can get your blood ketone value. And then the meter will immediately calculate your glucose ketone index. And you look at the number. And if the number is low, like 2.0 or below, uh, then you're in this state of therapeutic ketosis. And then, then you, at least you know you're there. Then you can discuss that with your oncologist or your physician and see whether or not you can add on some, some, some other minor drugs, like um, perhaps a parasite medication or some of these other things, and see whether or not the lumps go down, the, the, the swollen uh, gl- or lymph nodes uh, go down. So a lot of people with prostate cancer can do this because they can get a diagnosis of prostate cancer with a high PSA, and then they go like Guy Tannenbaum. Then you go on these metabolic approaches and it goes down to almost zero. So what happened? They were going to rip this guy's prostate out and do all kinds of mutilation stuff, and it didn't need to do it at all, you know. So, um, so, so any event, yeah. So there's a lot of things you can do, um, but that you have to have the tools and the knowledge to do this. And uh, so the glucose ketone, ketone index is the way to uh, at least know what your what the metabolic state of your body is. I have about two more questions. One is the sun. Does the sun cause cancer? And can you tell us about melanomas? Well, you know, melanoma is um, a, a cancer of the melanocyte in, in your skin. And, um, y- you know, I, I mean, sun exposure can certainly put you at risk, I think. Um, but uh, uh, sun is good for you as well. So, um, you know, I, I can only say that it's no different from any other cancer and you need to target glucose and glutamine to, to keep it under control. Okay. Um, okay, that's good to know. So it sounds like overall people do have some control of, of what's going on and they don't necessarily have to just jump right into all these therapies that hospitals and doctors are offering. So I really like that. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I did have one other question. Sometimes I see people, they look so healthy and I don't know. I haven't asked a doctor this before. They'll have this belly that looked like they swallowed like four basketballs and they look so healthy. I can see them exercising. Or I'm like, is this alcohol? Is this inflammation? What? Why do some people have this huge healthy body, but then this huge belly? Well, I don't know if you want to call it that. If the, if the body is that healthy, you won't have that belly. True. <laughs> they look thin, but then they have this hard looking belly. What is it? Yeah, well, that's, you know, some of that could be metabolic syndrome, which is definitely not part of being healthy. Um, but again, you know, but I, you, you can't, if, if people do exercise, that's one way to, keep, to stay into a healthier, healthier state. Get their, get their blood ketones up and their glucose down. Water only fasting does that. You can really get in. Dominic D'Agostino, expert on doing all this kind of stuff. So um, yeah, he does it all. He's always in ketosis. If Dominic ever gets cancer, I'm gonna be really surprised. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if everybody you go out, look up Dominic D'Agostino. Yeah, he's a very not. healthy guy. He's always in ketosis, works out all the time. Very fit, fit guy. So um, doesn't eat any uh, pro- highly processed carbohydrates. So, um, you know, but but he's he's healthy. And I, I noticed he's on one of your studies. Let's see which one. Yeah, he's on several of our papers. He's on our Press Pulse paper and he's on. Oh, Press Pulse. Yeah. yeah he, he, there he is, Dominic D'Agostino. Okay. Yeah, Dom D'Agostino. 
you know, he's a very healthy guy. So um, he does not have, uh, his stomach does not look like he swallowed basketballs. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my last question has to do with inflammation. Someone asked about if you know Dr. Terry Walls and the Walls Protocol, because she did a TED talk maybe 10, 11 years ago that she had multiple sclerosis. And I believe her basic story is she was vegan, very plant-based, very healthy, but somehow she discovered on her own, she eats liver once a week, no more than six to eight ounces. She eats grass-fed beef every day and certain particular specific carbohydrates, which I don't know. What do you think of just general information for multiple sclerosis or even bipolar schizophrenia? Just, I think my question is just about general information. You know, I can't, protocol. Yeah, well, I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, a bipolar disease or any of these kinds of things. Uh, there are reports in the scientific literature that diet and lifestyle issues can impact e either positively or negatively on these particular conditions. So, um, but again, they involve some level of inflammation and uh, the metabolic approach reduces inflammation. But I can't say that a metabolic approach that we use for cancer would have an impact on, on bipolar disease or multiple sclerosis. Okay. It seems like a similar story. That's why I asked that these people are typically going keto when they have those issues. I just want to say a little bit more about the professor, doctor, before we go, because his background is so amazing. Like I said, he was even served in Vietnam. He was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Neurology at the Yale University School of Medicine, and then served on the faculty as assistant professor in neurology, other awards and honors have come from such diverse organizations as the American Oil Chemist Society, the National Institute of Health, the American Society of Neurochemistry, and the Ketogenic Diet Special Interest Group of the American Epilepsy Society. Dr. Seafried previously served as chair of scientific advisory committee for the National Taste Sacks and Allied Disease Association. He's received lifetime achievement awards from the Academy of Complementary and Integrative Medicine, the Internal Dose Response Society, the Uncompromising Science Award from the American College of Nutrition for his work on cancer. He presently serves on several editorial boards, including those for nutrition and meta. meta metabolism, neurochemical research, the Journal of Lipid Research, ASN Neuro, where he is a senior editor. Dr. Seafried has over 200 peer-reviewed publications, is the author of the book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, on the origin, management, and prevention of cancer, Wiley Press. By the way, you'll see the book is kind of high price for a book, but that's why it has so much information, and it's the very classic Wiley Press, that's why. His book was recently translated into Chinese and is now under contract for translation in Turkish, and his full list of peer-reviewed publications can be found on PubMed. So I just had to say that because just you just need to know he has done so much and so accomplished. Anything else you want to teach us before we go? No, I think I think I've covered. I, I'd be happy to answer any you know questions that people may have because a lot of this stuff is just so new, and uh, when people hear it for the first time, they're they're like really overwhelmed, uh, and sometimes just are amazed that all of this could be there and they did never heard of it, and uh, they get this this. Uh, franchise when they go and ask their oncologist, yeah. you know, about this, they get very frustrated and they say, oh, no, everything that I'm saying, uh, none of this exists and it's not been proven or evaluated. And then the poor patient doesn't know what to think. And um, it's very frustrating because uh, they, they should know about it and they should have uh, an understanding at least of best they can. So I try to publish as much of this in open access journals, as I've already indicated, that at least gives them a chance to to, to read it. Um, and I think that's the best we can do at this time until the system changes. Um, and it will change. It's just, I just don't know when that's going to happen. Because the current system is not working. Yeah. And it's interesting, you, you said the acronym of quite a few times, standard of care today for cancer. It's the acronym SOC. So sometimes maybe we need to stick a sock in it because they're doing the same thing over and over when they just need to try something else. I never heard it that way, but I guess it could be. <laughs> read professor's book and read his articles and then we'll have more answers and you can, yeah. maybe these people can pull the sock out of their mouth and we can learn a lot more. Yeah, because that's a good plan. <laughs> yeah. Thank God you're, you're, you're able to speak freely and, and not, not every doctor can do that. So well, I don't we treat patients. You, you got to remember, I'm not a yeah. physician. I can't treat patients. I can't yeah. tell anybody what to do or what not to do. All I can do is give them the information and then they would discuss it with their, with their physicians. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you so much, Professor Doctor. And thank you everyone for being here.